You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews. How are you all? Are you okay? Well, we have got a bit of a stunner of an episode today. There are so many books to talk to you about. Uh, One of the reasons for that is that there will be a two-week break. I had a two-week break over Christmas and it's going to be a two-week break over summer. Over summer, that makes it sound like it's lasting many, many months. It's not. After this episode, uh, there'll be two weeks where there isn't an episode and then I will be back again. But because of that, I have so many books I have to talk to you about and some great authors to talk to. So we're going to be going through eight books. I just had to count that. Yeah, eight books, all really good so different, honestly. I'm sorry for your budgets because there's some great ones and uh, two particularly are going to be on pre-order. So I thought they would be interesting to look at that as well. Now, before we move on, let's look at what everyone in the lovely Facebook group is reading at the moment. So I was reading at the time All About Evie by Matson Taylor. And there's a link to this episode about that. Uh, Claire said she's also been approved to read that on NetGalley. So she was looking forward to reading that. Pat was reading Heart of the Deal by Lindsay McMillan. Sue's reading Moon Over Soho by Ben Aronovich. Rob's reading Murder Before Evensong by the Reverend Richard Coles. Johan's reading The Apartment Upstairs by Leslie Cara. We've got Amanda, who's reading Dark Places by Gillian Flynn. Richard's just started reading Edge of the Grave by Robbie Morrison. And then we've got Heidi, who's reading Such a Quiet Place by Megan Miranda. Deirdre's reading Eileen by, oh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this right, so apologies now, Otessa Moshfe. Deb is just finished Good Girl, Bad Girl by Michael Robotham and is about to start reading The Atlas Six. Hilda's reading Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. And Jean is reading Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. What a selection. You're all reading lots of books and I've got lots of books. So, yeah, there will, uh, before I go away, I am hoping to go away. Although, as I sit here talking to you, when I've done this, I'm about to go and do a Covid test because I'm not feeling so great. But as we always say, it's all fine. We've got books, so it'll all be fine. I'm going to record a couple more episodes that will happen after the break. So I don't need to do that when I'm away. Can you imagine sitting by the pool, say, talking about books? Actually, it could be quite nice. I know I've said that. I quite like the idea. Anyway, so the the few first few episodes that happen after the break will have been recorded before I'm away and then I'll be back. And I'm just looking forward to reading some different books. I've got all sorts of ideas of what I'm going to take. I haven't even considered what clothes I'm taking. It's just what books am I taking? Let's get the priorities. Anyway, priorities today. What books are you going to talk about, Philippa? Let me tell you. We have All About Evie by Matson Taylor and Matson's going to come on and talk to us. We've got The Reunion by Polly Phillips and Polly's going to answer five questions in five minutes. We've got Upgrade by Blake Crouch. We've got Deep Water by Emma Bamford. Berlin by B. Setton. I'm Sorry You Feel That Way by Rebecca Waite. Dark Earth by Rebecca Stott. And Truly, Darkly Deeply by Victoria Selman. Your girl's been busy. I have been doing a lot of reading, but let's get started now. All about Evie. Oh, now there's a different blurb. So excuse me while I find this blurb that I need uh, because they have changed it from the copy that I have. OK, here we go. Listen to this. 1972, 10 years on from the events of the miseducation of Evie Epworth. Evie is settled in London working for the BBC. She has everything she's ever dreamed of, a career, a leatherette briefcase and an Aussie Clark poncho. But following an unfortunate incident involving Princess Anne and a Hornsey pottery mug, she finds herself having to rethink her life and piece together work, love, grief and multiple pairs of cork-soled platform sandals. Ghosts from the past and the spirit of the future collide in a joyous adventure that sees Evie navigate the choppy waters of her messy twenties. Can a 60s miseducation prepare her for the growing pains of the 1970s? Big-hearted, uplifting, bittersweet and tender, All About Evie is a novel fizzing with wit and alive to the power of friendship in all its forms. 
it was just lovely. I sobbed at the end in joy because it's just lovely. I just love Evie. I really do. It makes me happy reading this, this book. Okay, first sentence. <laughs> I'm going to read you a bit more because... because it, yeah, OK. I am the wind. I skeet across tarmac and whoosh over dale. Birds skate along my amorphous limbs and the sun bakes down on my back. Yes, that's quite enough hot air for today, Evie. That's Pamela, my boss, the producer. I'm in the Woman's Hour recording studio at Broadcasting House and I'm sound checking for an extremely special recording. Princess Anne is coming to do an interview. Amazing. Pamela, grey hair, jodper bothering, cruciverbalist, <laughs> pulled a few horsey strings to get the interview and, ever since, she's been busy arranging everything with the planning and precision of a moon landing. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. Absolutely wonderful. If you've read the first book, The Miseducation of Evie Epworth, you will know how much it's lovely and you will want to read more. And if you haven't read that one, don't worry, just go for this second one. Um, it's, it's glorious. But let's talk to Matson now. Matson Taylor, author of All About Evie, welcome back to the podcast. It's brilliant to be back, Philippa. Uh, you were my very first podcast but when The Miseducation of Evie Epworth came out. And, you know, you never forget the third. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, well, this book, honestly, I, it, it's the first time. I don't know if you've heard this from other people, but as I finished the book, I did weep. It really, it's such a lovely book. Somebody else just texted me today about this, actually, yeah, an early reader, saying you know, tears of joy at the end, which was which filled me with tears of joy. That's exactly what I yeah. wanted. And, and even... You know, like with the very first draft, when I first sent it off to Chris, my editor, um, he phoned me straight after and he said, I've just been crying at the end of the book. So I thought, oh, that's good. That's a good sign. I like people to cry. It's not awful crying, happy, happy crying. I hasten <laughs> to add for, uh, for, for those listening. Right. So this is the second book in the EV trilogy but you make it I would say very easy for people who haven't read book one I'd say don't worry about it just read book two if you can get your mitts on it and it's bound to make you want to go back and read the first book but I think you're you're very uh, forgiving of us if we haven't read the first one yeah that w I was very aware of the fact that I had to make it enjoyable and, and accessible for for everyone so not just people who'd read the first book and I you know, had a good think about that. You know, how much do I background information do readers need? But yeah, I, I, hopefully I've made it I mean, holding people's hand and, and, and as they enter the EV world in a, in a nice, easy, joyful, friendly way. And just on the first few pages, I was just smiling. Your use of words and just uh, the imagery. I just thought it was, uh, it, it was wonderful. Did you did you get that as you were writing it or was it? Quite a hard slog. I, do you know, I absolutely love writing in the voice of Evie because she is a very a, a bright young woman who loves words and has a specific way with words and playing with words. So it's I always say Evie is a better writer than I am uh, because because it's just <laughs> wonderful, you know, like being able to in you know inhabit Evie, the persona of Evie, and and just really just go for it and send lots of linguistic fireworks out there everywhere and have lots of fun with language and which is yeah I mean it's kind of what I'd love to be able to do if I were anywhere near as good as Evie is yeah <laughs> well you are because you're, you're you're writing it but I have to admit there's always this pressure for authors with book two and because the miseducation of Evie Epworth was for me so good. I have to admit, I was worried. I thought, how how can you pull it out of the bag again? Uh, clearly, you did. So you delivered it brilliantly. But did you feel that pressure? Huge pressure. Uh, yeah, and it was awful because the the first book, um, you know, I I wrote it and didn't even really think about it getting published. You know, particularly when I was doing the first draft and the second draft. And then suddenly it came out and, yeah, it did really well. We were BBC Radio 2 book club and the Richard and Judy book club. And it was just amazing, such an amazing thing. And then suddenly I thought, right, now I've got to write another book. Um, and I sat down and thought, well, what I did with Evie, I just wrote the book that I wanted to write and a book that I enjoyed writing. It was a, a, a huge amount of fun to write 
the first book. And I thought that's exactly what I want to do with the second book. Um, and, and so that's what I did. I just really wrote a book that would make me happy. You know, I, I wrote this second book through through COVID. Um, and you know, I think we've all had quite a hard time. And just being able to disappear into Eevee world, into the world of 1972 and London and, and just what was going on in Eevee's life. I loved it. It took me away. And yeah, it was a real, you know, sort of ray of light, you know, to, to quote one of my favorite songs. Yeah, it was just something wonderful. I was waking up at five o'clock in the morning every morning, and which sounds really miserable. But, you know, by the time I sort of got downstairs and had a cup of tea and I was there in 1972, it was just I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else other than you know, a dark 5 a.m. morning you know, in the winter. Oh, just writing about Evie. Let's talk about the time frame. So the first book is in the 1960s. This one is 10 years later. Did you have to sort of unpick where Evie was in the 1970s and how she was? Or were you absolutely certain from the very beginning? I started writing... The, the cis book the second book about two months before the first book came out and and i had i had just a month i think before the first book came out and i thought i'm going to try and get a couple of chapters written just because i was quite scared i hadn't written anything then for about six months or so we'd been working on the edits and you know and the, and the jackets and all of those things and i was i was scared thinking oh no maybe maybe eve has left me maybe the voice has gone so i wanted to try and just have a go um, and I was doing research and thinking around things and sat down and started to write it. And, and it was absolutely just like meeting an old friend. And, and you know, within a, a couple of sentences, Evie was there with me. And I just knew straight away when something was an Evie thing to say or wasn't an Evie thing to say, you know, delete, get rid of it. And, and it was absolutely just like, yeah, meeting an old friend again after I hadn't seen her for you know six months or something. It was wonderful. Yeah, and the time frame thing. I, I've I've always known that I wanted to do a 1962, 1972, and and hopefully if this one does well, a 1982, the, the third in the trilogy, um, because I'm interested in this idea of decades. It comes from my my work at the VNA as a historian and just talking about decades. So the first book was very much the when did the 1960s start. And I'm saying sort of 1972 in this small village in Yorkshire. And I think this second book is is really about when did the 60s end? And it wasn't the 31st of December 1969. The, the, the kind of, um, yeah, the, the, I don't know, the... The idealism of the 60s, that, that it went on into the 1970s, but dribbled out and died horribly sort of, yeah, in the summer of 1972, really, 72, 73, yeah. So they, I wanted to capture that, but also, you know, just the fun of Evie being there in London and, and, and everything that's happening. And once the 60s are finished, which they were, what happens next? What could possibly ever follow the 1960s? And, and I think for all these 60s, children that that question was there you know very very big you know written standing out in front of them and and they weren't quite sure and it was the next generation that sort of has to pick it up and do something so I wanted to try and capture all of that yeah in a fun way <laughs> oh and you did you really did after writing the second book was Evie even stronger to you was it harder to turn her off in your mind <laughs> It's really hard sometimes, yeah. Yeah, no, I, you know, just walking down the street, if I see something, like that's, you know, and, and, and sort of certain words come to my mind. I think, oh, I must try and write that down or send a text to myself because that's a very easy thing to see or thing to think about. And I, I mean, I absolutely feel like she, she is a, a, a real person and a friend and somebody who I know quite well. And I, it was really interesting with when the first book came out and I went out and started meeting readers and booksellers and quite a few um, sort of ladies in their 70s were coming up to me and saying, like, oh, you know, I'd be the same age as Evie now, as if Evie was around now. And, and the, when, when the first time somebody said that, I thought, oh, my God, yeah, I've not thought about that because in my head she was 16 and a half back then. But now I can see her as, you know, a, a somebody in her 70s. And I just think, God, I wish she were around. I want her in my life now are you tempted to keep 
going writing the each decade after the third one the original idea it was a trilogy so it, there's a story arc to, to all three books yeah. um i think really it depends on how well the the books do if people are interested in in reading and seeing evie you know in in, in her 70s in the 2020s I, I i know chris my editor at simon just would be very happy about that the, the the next book that i'm going to write actually is a non-evie book so my book three will be a completely separate standalone book. And then my my book four, the fourth book I write, will be EV3, which is very complicated to explain. But yeah. No, that's that's fine. I'm a bit sad about that. Sorry, <laughs> on the next EV straight away. It's, for me, it's just a book about jubilation. It's just joy. It's, it's pure joy running through it. And there aren't many books like that. Yeah, like I said, I, w- I wanted to write a book that um, I would enjoy writing, that, that gave me joy to write. And, and, and you know, I sort of poured all of that into, into the book. There, there are moments of sadness as well. Yes. Um, but I wanted, you know, ultimately for it to be a book of, yeah, an optimistic book and a book about, you know, all the different possibilities of, of different kinds of friendship. And you know acceptance and all of those things. I wanted it to be a yeah a lovely, um, bright, sunny, joyful book, you know, tempered with some you know darker moments. For me, the first book was about uh, more about some threats: the yeah. threat of family life, the threat of home, the threat of future. Not in a thriller way, but just where Evie was in her life. Whereas this one, for me seem to be entirely about love love of self love of others love of past it, it, it was different which was lovely in itself yeah i i really wanted i'm it's lovely to hear that because i wanted the book to be um you know really strongly about love in all the different kinds of love that you can get mm-hmm. and and of course you know evie's evie's 26 and a half in this book she's very interested in love you know which 26 and a half year old isn't you know of, of, you know of any gender or anything everybody just wants love at that point it's really you know, one of the most important things that everybody wants isn't it and and Evie's no different um but you know Evie being Evie she's not quite sure what kind of love she wants or, and she you know she she generally chooses very inappropriate men and it's all about you know how love creeping up on her and yeah I can't say too much but yeah she she eventually yeah we, we she, she understands what love is, I suppose. OK, so now we're going to have some quick fire questions before we go back to some of the, the longer ones. So let's see what your responses are to these. 1970s fashion or 1970s music? Oh, it's 1970s music. Lots of edits or no edits? Lots of edits. I love edit. I never stop editing. <laughs> book cover or book title? Oh, Ooh. book title because that's the one I have more control over. <laughs> <laughs> audio book or ebook? I was going to say audio book, just because um, they do such a fantastic job with them. And Helen, the actor, is just marvellous. She did the first book and she's doing the second book. Very good. And the, the last quick one, books arranged by author or by colour? Oh, by author. It would be by author, yeah. My, my books on my shelf are by chronology. <laughs> This is kind of what I, this is the this is the English literature graduate yeah. in me. It just yeah. goes from like Beowulf to up to the present day, so that's what they're like. Yeah. Do you use the number system as well in your home library? If you got, got it that bad, <laughs> no, I'm not that bad. No, but I'm like, but I, they are all chronological. So. <laughs> Keeps my brain ticking over, so I can remember. You know, like, oh, this is. 18th century French poem I know where to put it kind of thing but I'm the same with my colours my children say there's no way I can find a book so I say right tell me a book name the book author and I can find the book so it's it's <laughs> weird how the cut co- mine arranged by colours I just know where they are but we're as, all as long as it works that's the main thing yes yeah. yeah. I'm interested <laughs> in your journey as a writer because you have gone through such extraordinary things you know the book being hyped so much how how have you found that? The pressure really coming out of the, particularly the paperback, which has done very well, and with Richard and Judy and, and sales have been very good. Um, then to sit down and start writing the second book, that that 
that pressure just sits on your shoulder and 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 I kind of fretted about that for for a little bit and then just thought well I'm just gonna have to forget about it and that actually um lockdown worked for me in a way because i i wrote a lot of this book in the was it the third lockdown yeah after the christmas and i i went up to my dad's up in yorkshire for christmas a couple of weeks before christmas um and stayed there until i think june something like that june july and so i don't know just that geographical distance from London and all the pressure of you know the publishers being there and and I was just you know dad lives in a a little village in the countryside and I used to go for a couple of walks every day out across the fields and you know chat to the cows and and all things like that 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 just enabled me to forget really about the pressure and and to think about Evie it's odd though because I wrote the first book set in Yorkshire when I was mainly living here in London, in my back in London. And then the second book, set mainly in London, I wrote up in Yorkshire. So it's a bit it's a bit strange, yeah. So can you tell us where you're planning to write your next book? Will that give us any clues to where it's going? Uh, well, I can tell you where it's going to be set. The next book is going to be set in Rome. It's going to be set in Rome in the mid to late 70s. So it's going to be set there. So I'm hoping, and maybe not right it in Rome but I'm hoping for some nice research trips because I used to live in Rome I know Rome really well so I can't wait to get back and and I really think you need a, a podcaster to come with you to assist you with that research because you know I... it's absolutely essential <laughs> I can't write the book without it I will definitely you'll be you'll be hearing from my agent <laughs> I'm packing my satchel as as we speak um, let's talk about pre-orders because this book comes out in a few weeks time and pre-orders are gosh they're so important at the at the moment can can you tell us a little bit more about that yeah, I didn't really know very much about pre-orders until un- until the second book, um, because obviously with the, the first book, with it being a debut novelist, um, that there really weren't that many pre-orders because nobody knew who I was, what the book was. And then the PR and marketing team at Simon & Schuster said, told me how important um, the pre-orders are. There, there's all kinds of algorithms that feed into pre-orders and, and it you know, all of those pre-orders all count towards the first week sales. And, and those first week sales are so important in so many ways, because that's how bookshops decide if they're going to stock the book and how many copies they'll get. Um, you know, so many books come out every single week as well. So I think if there's um, a bit of a buzz around a book, a bookseller might decide to read the book, which is always fantastic, because of course there are so many books that come out that booksellers can't possibly read every single book that comes out every week. So a lot of very, very good books um, get passed by, really, because booksellers, without the booksellers being able to read it, and who can then talk to their customers, it's very difficult to find the book. But once a bookseller, and particularly independent bookshops, once they get behind a book and they've read it and enjoyed it, then all kinds of magical things can happen. So, yeah, that's very important. Hence the badges. This is why Simon just said they're giving away free Eevee badges and an art print. You know, in, in uh, I think in sort of March or April, I was sat one evening signing uh, you know, 500 of these art prints, uh, you know, one evening. So, you know, you get a signed Mattson Taylor art print of, the, of an Eevee cover. Uh, yes, it's gold dust, gold dust. And you mentioned independent bookshops. And I think that's important because when someone talks about pre-ordering, we often just think about going online and pressing pre-order, but you can order through local bookshops. And there's a, a special book that they could they could get, I believe. It's got a special style. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the independent bookshops, um, actually, a lot of the independent bookshops will have some of these Eevee badges and, and the, uh, the art prints as well that you will get and you'll be given them. Otherwise, you have to they're posted out to you. Otherwise, Simon has just done a web page. Uh, but the independent bookshops will also have a special edition of the book. Um, and it's got it's going to have lovely yellow sprayed edges. And it's going to be an absolute, just a, a sunshine, a sunshine bomb, an explosion of joy and sunshine. Just everything's going to be yellow and lovely, yeah. And of course, as well, I, I get round so many independent bookshops. It's highly likely that if you get one from an independent bookshop. I'll have signed it because it's, it's finding one unsigned from an independent bookshop that'll be the hard thing. I think. <laughs> 
I like to get around and chat to the booksellers. No, that's, that's lovely. Yeah. What would you say now, then, is your greatest writing challenge? Book three. <laughs> the next book is my greatest writing challenge, I think. Yeah. Try, trying to um, write in, in a non Eevee voice. Yeah. So I'll have a book three will, book, mm. book one is very, or book one and book two with the first person narrator of Eevee. You, know, you inhabit that voice. Um, the Both books have these things called interludes, which are kind of flashbacks, which are written in the third person and they have a different tone. And I've, I've really enjoyed writing in that third person with that different tone because I think I get, managed to get a little bit of my voice in there as well and so I'm really looking forward mm. to, to doing that and yeah developing a, a narrator you know a third person narrator and for it to be lots of fun and, and you know and, and, and joyful um, but to do it in a, in a slightly different way I'm looking forward to that. Well can't wait to read it could you just write it now? Now straight away, please. Um, what would you say if you could go back and whisper in your ear when you are just sitting there writing the first Evie book? What would you tell yourself? Gosh, I don't know. I, I probably wouldn't say, you know, oh, you know, this is going to be published because actually just writing the first book, I, I probably taken away the, the the pressure of being published that that was quite a nice thing about writing the first book and and you know you take your time you're learning so much with the first book I think everybody's first book always takes a very long time because it's a learning process it's an apprenticeship and and actually by somebody saying oh yeah you know, just get to the end and then it's going to be published and it'll do really well you, you you wouldn't learn anywhere near as much as what you did with going through all the multiple edits and you know the hard days and sticking it in a drawer and for a couple of weeks and pulling it out again um and and actually as well as soon as you get a you know a publishing deal your your head is full of lots of other things like you know like the pr and marketing and and the you know the cover and all of those things whereas actually when you're just writing the book you're, you're just and that's the best thing you know immersed in the book so i think for me yeah writing the book without knowing that it was going to be published was actually a very good thing i know it sounds a bit odd so what would i whisper to myself um gosh i don't know um eat don't have quite as many biscuits when you just sat eat at the computer all the time because <laughs> <laughs> you know, writing's not good for my health. I think I went. I've just recently had a cholesterol test, and the nurse has been nagging me for high cholesterol. And she was saying, "You know, what? What's your job?" And I said, "Well, I sit down at the computer and write for about like sixteen hours a day, and with a cup of tea and like a packet of dark chocolate hobnobs." And her face, you know, she wasn't impressed at all. So yeah, develop healthy eating habits when I'm writing. You know, a few carrots or something. Oh no, that sounds uh, very uninspiring. Keep keep with the hot <laughs> But no, that's great. Well, we can't wait to see all the success of this second book, all about Evie. Mats and Taylor, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for asking me, Philippa. Thank you. And the next book is The Reunion by Polly Phillips. And let's do the blurb on this one. Emily Toller has tried to forget her time at university and the events that led her to suddenly leave under a cloud. She's done everything she can to forget the shame and the trauma and the people involved. She's tried to focus on the life she has built with her children and husband, Nick. But events like that can't just be forgotten, not without someone answering for what they've done. When an invitation arrives to a university reunion, everything clicks into place. Emily has a plan. Because if you can't forget, why not get revenge? Yes, indeed. Oh, I've lost, there's my notes. Let me just get to the first sentence. Uh, well, OK, the, well, the first sentence is, um, isn't chapter one, it's before that. So here we go. My eyes feel like they're about to burst out of their sockets. I can't breathe. Fingers that were curled harmlessly around the stem of a wine glass at dinner earlier are now crushing my windpipe. And I'm just standing here taking it. I used to read scare stories in magazines like Just Seventeen of girls being preyed upon as they got off the last train or walked home from school. I'd imagine that in their place I would floor my attacker with a well-aimed kick and leg it. Instead, I'm doing nothing. This book is... I did enjoy it. It really got me thinking. got me thinking about reunions as well and uh, all the the horrors that might people might try to forget and then and then can't. Uh, but let's talk to Polly now. 
So Polly Phillips, author of The Reunion, welcome to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. Well, very excited. A great book and really looking forward to talking to you. But as we get started, can you kick off by summarising your book in about 30 seconds? Okay, so The Reunion is a classic revenge tale um, set on um, a college or a university um, campus. It tells the story of Emily, who um, joins uh, Cambridge University and somehow miraculously falls in with the in crowd. And she's living her best life until one night it all falls horribly um, wrong. Everything falls apart. Um, Fifteen years later, the um, invitation to a university reunion um, lands on her doorstep and she thinks now is my time to go and get revenge. So it's a perfect book for anyone who's spent years worrying about what people think of them or would like to go back and give university a second try and do it better. (laughs) Absolutely. And it's got some great sort of revelations and uh, yes, uh, very interesting conclusion. <laughs> um, who's your favourite smaller character that you wrote in this book? I think it's got to be Helen, the big sister. She probably is the big sister. I would like, I've got two horrible older brothers <laughs> who probably won't listen to this because they can't do anything technological. Um, so I think Helen is the sister that I would love to have had. Oh, that's lovely. That's great. So what three words would you use to describe what you want people to feel when they're reading this book? Ooh, tricky. Um, if I was I, if I was describing that, I might describe it as the bad old days, not having the as a word, so bad old days, obviously the university times. Um, but I, I hope that people will feel um, uh, understood, uh, sympathetic um, and gripped. Very good. Yeah, I like those. That, that, those work for me. Um, so now we come on to the most important question, of course. <laughs> What food and drink (laughs) did you consume while you were writing all of the food and drink? No, I'm I am an incredible (laughs) (laughs) I'm an incredible sugar monster. Um, so I can't. I have to have at least a hot chocolate, one hot chocolate a day. Um, I'm really picky about my hot chocolate. It has to be um, melted chocolate. So I have this whole process of melting it in the saucepan. I'm a terrible cook, so it's the only thing I do in the kitchen. Um, so I have this vat of hot chocolate as I write and I feel like I actually can't write without it. <laughs> um, and then fine. food, just anything, e- food, just anything easy to make, because once I'm in the flow, I don't want to just so probably a lot of bagels and crumpets and non-complex carbs. <laughs> so do you have to turn your keyboard over afterwards and sort of shake it out so the, the crumbs go or are you... Uh, is that not an issue? No, I'm disgustingly sticky fingered. No, I see. I give it a good, uh, I blow on it every so often and sort of peer at it a bit. I'm doing that now, actually, <laughs> peering at it a bit concernedly, worrying what germs. There might, be, there might be the cure to something absolutely amazing on the S key of my keyboard. <laughs> Um, but Polly we're recording this you're currently in Australia and you're coming back to the UK shortly have you heard if you like hot chocolates have you heard of something called the Hotel Chocolat Velvetizer the Velvetizer I've long toyed the Velvetizer has sat in my online shopping basket for many many months Um, and I have although I'm not coming back to the UK until next week my hotel chocolate order is already (laughs) waiting for me at my in-laws house (laughs) yes because as you were talking I was like this girl needs a velvetizer seriously (laughs) it's a revelation (laughs) think how productive I could be um and you can get variety packs yes yes this is a really disgusting um habit that I will share um full (laughs) disclosure and it's not good for the keyboard but sometimes um when I'm when I finish my hot chocolate, but I still haven't finished my word count, I will actually tip the variety pack, the um, grated chocolate from the variety pack straight into my mouth, <laughs> which is pretty vile. <laughs> if it keeps you going, if it keeps the words yeah. going, then you've just got to do what you've got exactly. to do. <laughs> It makes you more human. But yes, get get a variety pack for the Hotel Chocolat ones because they're they're very good yes and I, I sometimes I have it with skim milk and then I think well this is healthy <laughs> exactly this exactly is, this is calcium it's good for my bones so. <laughs> I think I must have very strong bones <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too um your final question what's been the most memorable moment so far in your writing career so I'm a huge fan of yours so I did um I did know this question was coming and I've been thinking about it all day and <laughs> wondering what 
And I, I could give all of the kind of um, sort of traditional answers, like having champagne and getting an agent and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think actually what really struck me today was um, about six months ago, my uncle, who I'm in sporadic um, WhatsApp contact with, he's lovely and super eccentric. Um, he sent me a picture and I didn't really understand what the picture was at first. It was just this woman sitting on a beach in a deck chair who I did not recognise from Adam. Um, and then when I zoomed in, um, she was reading My Best Friend's Murder, which was my first book. Um, and he didn't know her either. And he had found her on this beach reading the book and said, oh, my niece wrote that and took a picture and sent it to me. So even though it's a blurry picture of a woman I don't know <laughs> on a beach that I've never been to, that is the most memorable thing I have. A stranger in a swimming costume is your, is your yes. most memorable <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> No, I think that's wonderful. I remember the day, you know, it always used to be you go on holiday and there'd be one book that everyone would be reading. Yes. And to have a photo of someone reading your book, uh, yeah, I can understand that would that's so impartial and independent and and they're reading. Well, that's it. exactly that's it, isn't it? I mean, the the feedback you get from those around you, I mean, obviously it's so valuable and you really treasure it, but you know that people who sort of share um, genes with you have this sort of <laughs> They have the obligation to be nice. Yes. <laughs> Whereas this woman did not. <laughs> and yet she was still reading it. Which she was. Shows. Maybe she hated it, but the picture <laughs> makes it look like she enjoyed it. You don't read a book you hate on holiday. That just that's not a thing. So, yeah, clearly she was enjoying it as we enjoy your books. Well, Polly Phillips, author of The Reunion. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. No, thank you. I've had such a blast. You take care. Just as with... Evie, all about Evie. The reunion is published on the 21st, this one, the 21st of July. So pre orders are so important. In fact, after we recorded, I was talking to Polly Phillips, this author of The Reunion, about pre orders. And she said she's desperate for another puppy. And her husband has said that only if there are enough this book does well enough can she get another puppy so I think she's relying on us all to get those pre-orders in so yeah great the reunion Polly Phillips um now the next book is Upgrade and I need to get my I need to search this up because I read it as an ebook. I know who'd have thought you wouldn't imagine that I would do that but I did and it was very very good indeed in fact while I'm Oh, you see, I'm trying to type in really quickly. Upgrade. There we go. Upgrade Blake Crouch. I think this is Blake's best book. Some of his, I love all his writing and some of them make my head bend so much. I actually feel like it's been, I don't know, compressed. And you just think, oh, my goodness. Whereas this book, yes, there was lots to to read and take on board. Um, but... I found it, it wasn't, say it's easier to read is, is the wrong thing entirely, but uh, I don't know. I didn't have to take a ton of anodine afterwards. I was there. I was just enjoying it so much. Full of action. Really, 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 really good. And now, of course, I can't even get the blurb for this. Here we go. Are you ready for this? What if you were capable of more. Your concentration was better, you could multitask quicker, read faster, memorise more, sleep deeper. For Logan Ramsay, it's happening. He's beginning to see the world around him, even those he loves the most in whole new ways. He knows that it's not natural, that his genes have been hacked. He's been targeted for an upgrade. Logan's family legacy is one he's been trying to escape for decades and it has left him vulnerable to attack, but with a terrifying plan in place to replicate his upgrade throughout the world's population, he may be the only person capable of stopping what has already been set in motion. To win this war against humanity, Logan will now have to become something other than himself. This was such a good book. Now I need to open up the Kindle to read the first sentence to you. So yeah, I'm I'm waffling a bit now as I'm doing it. But if you are a fan of Blake Crouch, or if you've read his books, some of his books before, and thought I love his books, but my goodness, that takes some getting my head round, then I think you would really love this. Right here we go. <laughs> we found Henrik Soren at a wine bar in the International Terminal, thirty minutes from boarding a hyperjet to Tokyo. 
Before tonight, I had only seen him in Interpol photographs and CCTV footage. In the flesh, he was less impressive. Five and a half feet in his artificially distressed Saint Laurent sneakers with a designer hoodie hiding most of his face. He was sitting at the end of the bar with a book and a bottle of Krug. I'm going to leave it there. Honestly, I loved it. Oh, and I got that from Book Break. So thank you, Book Break, for that. Excellent. So from one excellent book to another one. Oh, this is good. Deep Water, Emma Bamford. Virginie and Jake spend all their savings on a yacht and set sail for Amaranti, a remote island rumoured to be a paradise. But what starts as a dream can quickly descend into a nightmare. And even paradise comes with a price. I found this book mesmerising. I really enjoyed it. We've recently had um, William Shaw, G.W. Shaw, talking about Dead Rich, his book, which is set on this sort of luxury boat. This, I mean, if you enjoyed it, you'll enjoy this, but this is different again. That's what I love. Even something in a similar place, a similar location. Um, it's just it's so different and I really enjoyed it. Um, you've got this island where there's no power, no phones. You know, I just thought, no, thank you. There's no way I'd go there. But it's 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 a thriller, but there's much more to it. I found it so engaging. I was completely there. So it, it read very sort of believably and it built up this picture in front of me. And I, yeah, I just thought it was excellent. So Deep Water, Emma Bamford, bravo. Next one, Berlin by B. Seton. This was, again, this was different, but so interesting. Here we go. My name is, is Daphne. I didn't read a first sentence, did I, of Deep Water? I'm so sorry. I read the introduction and I didn't read the first sentence. Here we go. When you spend as much time at the mercy of the sea as I have, your soul forgets how to rest. As a seafarer, your ability to react to the slightest change in the environment, be it internally in the structure and seaworthiness of your vessel or externally in the conditions of the ocean and sky that surround you, means everything. Lives depend on how quickly you act. And the one person who must always be attuned to each creak of a bulkhead or slam of the hull to a shift in the cadence of the engines or the howl of the wind is the captain. Very, very, very good. Uh, so next one, Berlin. Listen to this. My name is Daphne and I'm a PhD student in philosophy, moving to Berlin from London. I'm interested in your flat. I'm responsible and I take good care of people's homes and possessions. I'm non-smoking and quiet. Let me know if you're looking for someone. With best wishes, Daphne Ferber. P.S. I apologise for the email in English. My German is very basic. Point one, a lie. I was at the time recovering from a round of rejections from master's programmes in philosophy. I had been accepted nowhere. Number two, aspirationally true, but in fact a lie. Number three, true, except when someone I find attractive offers me a cigarette. And number four, about German being very basic. At this point in the story, it's very true indeed. This is so different. I was intrigued. It felt very European, the sort of hard, brittle narrator. You've got an unbelievable narrator or are they believable? You're in someone's mind, so it's uncomfortable. It's telling. It's interesting. It's thought provoking. Just everything. Uh, listen, listen to the beginning. Chapter one, a fresh start. I arrived in Berlin at the beginning of February before the shame and guilt brewing somewhere low in my stomach turned symptomatic. I was surprised about this book. It wasn't what I was expecting, but it really delivered. Yes, yeah, so if you're up for unreliable ne uh, narrators, if you'd like something not based in the UK, but in Europe, I think you'd really enjoy that one. Uh, so the next one, Rebecca Waite. I'm sorry you feel that way. And the minute I saw this book, I was like, I'm going to love this book very, very, very much indeed. And I did. So where's the blurb for this one? In fact, I'm just going to open this up. The cover as well is extraordinary. OK. It looks at the lives of two sisters, Alice and Hannah, who are pigeonholed a saint and sinner. Their mother takes a divide and conquer approach to child rearing and their father an absent one. There is their older brother, Michael, whose disapproval 
is a force to be reckoned with. And there is a catastrophe that is never spoken of, but which has shaped everything. As adults, Alice and Hannah negotiate increasingly complicated family tensions, finding themselves in situations that are often absurd and hilarious, but always acutely and often movingly written. Ultimately, they must decide at last whether life is really anything more than, as Hannah would have it, a tragedy with a few hilarious moments. Uh, oh, let's do first sentence, Philip, before you go on any more about how much you enjoyed this book. Right. Chapter one, 2018, 2018. On the whole, they enjoy a funeral. Michael, because it appeals to his sense of ceremony. Hannah, because she likes the drama. And Alice, because it brings people together. Their mother, because it gives her a sense of achievement. I just really, really like this book. I liked how it portrayed sibling relationships. I love the sort of the anxiety, how difficult relationships can be, how people sort of rub against each other and sometimes along with each other. It's all told. It's all about fa family dynamics. And uh, yeah, they say it's would appeal to every reader who loved Meg Mason's Sorrow and Bliss. I think even if you didn't get on with that book, you would enjoy this one. I think there's a lot to it. Um, yeah, I just really enjoyed it and particularly the sibling relationships. Bravo. So that's I'm Sorry You Feel That Way by Rebecca Waite. You're being very good with me. We've got two more books and then we are done. But you won't hear from me for another two weeks. So at least, at least there's that to save you. Now, this book. Oh, my goodness. It looks gorgeous. Dark Earth, Rebecca Stott. It's got this sort of gold cover. Amazing. So here we are. Isla has a secret. She has learned her father's sophisticated sword making skills at a time when even entering a forge is forbidden to women. Her sister Blue has a secret too. At low tide on the night of each new moon, she visits the bones of the mud woman, drowned by the elders of her tribe who wanted to make a lesson of someone who wouldn't hold her tongue. When the local Sikh's overlord discovers Isla's secret, there is nowhere for the sisters to hide except across the water to the walled ghost city, Londinium. Here Blue and Isla find sanctuary in an underworld community of squatters, immigrants, travellers and looters, led by the mysterious Crowther, living in an abandoned brothel and bathhouse. But trouble pursues them, even in the haunted city. And let's go to the very first oh we've got a we've got a map i've got a little map of uh, the river and the location which is always nice chapter one an island in the thames ad 500 isla and blue are sitting up on the mound watching the river creep up on the wrecks and over the black stubs of the old jetties out on the mud flats waiting for father to finish his work in the forge Along the far river bank, the ghost city, the great line of its long abandoned river wall, its crumbling gates and towers, is making its upside down face in the river again. Something's coming, sister, Blue says. Look. It's a lovely book. It's sort of a gentle book. If you're interested in that time period, particularly, I think, um, it just portrays everything very nicely. It's And as I say, the cover is gorgeous. It's uh, It's a gentle book but it's significant it's got it's got characters that just sort of pull you up and make you run with them yeah you know what I'm saying I liked it I liked it a lot and oh what here have I written I've also written it's original it's evocative it's very of its time and it's a fascinating portrait of that time you see the notes I write when I finish reading the book make much make much more sense don't they than me trying to say it but we're on to the last book and last but no means least listen to this truly darkly deeply by Victoria Selman 12-year-old Sophie and her mother Amelia Rose moved to London from Massachusetts when they meet the charismatic Matty Melgren, who quickly becomes an intrinsic part of their lives. But as the relationship between the two adults fractures, a serial killer begins targeting young women with a striking resemblance to Amelia Rose. When Matty is eventually set da sent down for multiple murders, questions remain as to his guilt, questions which ultimately destroy both women. Nearly 20 years later, Sophie receives a letter from Battlemouth Prison informing her that Matty is dying and wants to meet. It looks like Sophie might finally get the answers she craves, but will the truth set her free or bury her deeper? Yeah, I think you can tell what sort of a book this is. It's a very good one. Right, let's uh, go for the first chapter. Sophie, there's so much to tell you. I don't know where to start. The kite, maybe? 
It's not the beginning exactly, but I suppose it's as good a place as any. You watched it, transfixed, your nose pressed up to the glass as it circled. A black shadow creeping across the lawn, flying on the spot, you said, the way you liked to dance. So I was thinking it was going to be quite a hard book to read. Not hard as in, oh, it's written in a difficult way, but just a hard subject. And yes, it is quite dark in content, but I enjoyed it a lot. Um, it's again, not it's not unreliable narrators, but it's sort of you're just like processing everything. What's going on? What do I believe? What don't I? And I just found the take on it with this guy getting in touch um, from prison, dying. I thought that was very intriguing as well. Bravo, Victoria Selman. An excellent, excellent book. So there we go. Congratulations. You've made it through. I think I should just do a quick recap. So we've had All About Evie by Matson Taylor. What a wonderful book that was. We've had The Reunion by Polly Phillips. That was great. Polly joined us for the five in five. We've had Upgrade by Blake Crouch. What a book, Blake. You you go from strength to strength. Deep Water by Emma Bamford. Love that book. Berlin by B. Seton. My goodness, that I did enjoy that book. It's a weird but wonderful book. I hope I'm not. No, I don't mean that in a bad way. It was great. Really great. So then we had I'm Sorry You Feel That Way by Rebecca Waite, Dark Earth by Rebecca Stott and Truly Darkly Deeply by Victoria Selman. If there's not a book there that sounded of interest to you, then I don't know. I don't know what because... Well, we've, I suppose they're all fiction. So if you're only into non-fiction at the moment, then maybe not. But otherwise, I think there's something there for you. My thanks to Matt and Taylor and Polly Phillips for coming on the, the episode. And thank you to all the lovely authors for writing all their lovely books. Well, I'm off to go and do the COVID test. Let's see what happens. And uh, have a good few weeks. I will, as I say, I'll be recording the next couple before I go away. But... Yeah, just look after yourselves. Keep in touch with me. I love it. I love hearing from you. I really, really do. You are all, I was going to say you're very special to me, but does that sound a bit weird and condescending? I don't mean it like that. Um, I'm just so thankful to, to have you as my chums. So look after yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.